This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dusty Hodges. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 6. The youth awakened slowly. He came gradually back to a position from which he could regard himself. For moments he had been scrutinizing his person in a dazed way, as if he had never before seen himself. Then he picked up his cap from the ground. He wriggled in his jacket to make a more comfortable fit, and kneeling, relaced his shoe. He thoughtfully mopped his reeking features. So it was all over at last! The supreme trial had been passed. The red, formidable difficulties of war had been vanquished. He went into an ecstasy of self-satisfaction. He had the most delightful sensations of his life. Standing as if apart from himself, he viewed that last scene. He perceived that the man who had fought thus was magnificent. He felt that he was a fine fellow. He saw himself even with those ideals which he had considered as far beyond him. He smiled in deep gratification. Upon his fellows he beamed tenderness and goodwill. "'Gee, ain't it hot, hey?' he said affably to a man who was polishing his streaming face with his coat sleeves. "'You bet,' said the other, grinning sociably. "'I never seen such dumb hotness.' He sprawled out luxuriously on the ground. "'Gee, yes, and I hope we don't have no more fight until a week from Monday.' There were some handshakings and deep speeches with men whose features were familiar, but with whom the youth now felt the bonds of tied hearts. He helped a cursing comrade to bind up a wound of the shin. But, of a sudden, cries of amazement broke out along the ranks of the new regiment. "'Here they come again! Here they come again!' The man who had sprawled upon the ground started up and said, "'Gosh!' The youth turned quick eyes upon the field. He discerned forms begin to swell and masses out of a distant wood. He again saw the tilted flag speeding forward. The shells, which had ceased to trouble the regiment for a time, came swirling again and exploded in the grass or among the leaves of the trees. They looked to be strange war flowers bursting into fierce bloom. The men groaned. The luster faded from their eyes. Their smudged countenances now expressed a profound dejection. They moved their stiffened bodies slowly and watched in sullen mood the frantic approach of the enemy. The slaves toiling in the temple of this god began to feel rebellion at his harsh tasks. They fretted and complained, each to each. Oh, say, this is too much of a good thing. Why can't somebody send us supports? We ain't never gonna stand this second banging. I ain't come here to fight the whole damn rebel army. There was one who raised a doleful cry. I wish Bill Smithers had trod on my hand, instead of me treading on his'n. The sore joints of the regiment creaked as it painfully floundered in position to repulse. The youth stared. Surely, he thought, this impossible thing was not about to happen. He waited as if he expected the enemy to suddenly stop, apologize, and retire, bowing. It was all a mistake. But the firing began somewhere on the regimental line and ripped along in both directions. The sheets of flame developed great clouds of smoke that tumbled and tossed in the mild wind near the ground for a moment, then rolled through the ranks as though a gate. The clouds were tinged in earth-like yellow in the sun rays, and in the shadow were a sorry blue. The flag was sometimes eaten and lost in this mass of vapor, but more often it projected, sun-touched, resplendent. Into the youth's eyes there came a look that one can see in the orbs of a jaded horse. His neck was quivering with nervous weakness, and the muscles of his arms felt numb and bloodless. His hands, too, seemed large and awkward, as if he were wearing invisible mittens, and there was a great uncertainty about his knee joints. The words that comrades had uttered previous to the firing began to recur to him. Oh, say, this is too much of a good thing. What do they take us for? Why don't they send supports? I didn't come here to fight the whole damned rebel army. He began to exaggerate the endurance, the skill, and the valor of those who were coming. Himself reeling from exhaustion, he was astonished beyond measure at such persistency. They must be machines of steel. He was very glooming, struggling against such affairs, wound up perhaps to fight until sundown. He slowly lifted his rifle, and catching a glimpse of the thick spread field, he blazed at a cantering cluster. He stopped then and began to peer as best he could through the smoke. He caught changing views of the ground, covered with men, who were all running like pursued imps, and yelling. To the youth it was an onslaught of redoubtable dragons. He became like the man who lost his legs at the approach of the red and green monster. He waited in a sort of horrified, listening attitude. He seemed to shut his eyes and wait to be gobbled. A man near him, who up to this time had been working feverishly at his rifle, suddenly stopped and ran with howls. The lad whose face had borne an expression of exalted courage, the majesty of he who dares give his life, was, at an instant, smitten abject. He blanched like one who has come to the edge of a cliff at midnight and is suddenly made aware. There was a revelation. 
He, too, threw down his gun and fled. There was no shame in his face. He ran like a rabbit. Others began to scamper away through the smoke. The youth turned his head, shaken from his trance by this movement as if the regiment was leaving him behind. He saw the few fleeting forms. He yelled then with fright and swung about. For a moment, in the great clamor, he was like a proverbial chicken. He lost the direction of safety. Destruction threatened him from all points. Directly, he began to speed toward the rear in great leaps. His rifle and cap were gone. His unbuttoned coat bulged in the wind. The flap of his cartridge box bobbed wildly, and his canteen, by its slender cord, swung out behind. On his face was all the horror of those things which he imagined. The lieutenant sprang forward, bawling. The youth saw his features wrathfully red, and saw him make a dab with his sword. His one thought of the incident was that the lieutenant was a peculiar creature to feel interested in such matters upon this occasion. He ran like a blind man. Two or three times he fell down. Once he knocked his shoulder so heavily against a tree that he went headlong. Since he had turned his back upon the fight, his fears had been wondrously magnified. Death about to thrust him between the shoulder blades was far more dreadful than death about to smite him between the eyes. When he thought of it later, he conceived the impression that it is better to view the appalling than to be merely within hearing. The noises of the battle were like stones. He believed himself liable to be crushed. As he ran on, he mingled with others. He dimly saw men on his right and on his left, and he heard footsteps behind him. He thought that all the regiment was fleeing, pursued by those ominous crashes. In his flight, the sound of those following footsteps gave him his one meager relief. He felt vaguely that death must make a first choice of the men who were nearest. The initial morsels for the dragons would be then those who were following him. So he displayed the zeal of an insane sprinter in his purpose to keep them in the rear. There was a race. As he, leading, went across a little field, he found himself in a region of shells. They hurtled over his head with long, wild screams. As he listened, he imagined them to have rows of cruel teeth that grinned at him. Once, one lit before him, and the vivid lighting of the explosion effectively barred the way of his chosen direction. He groveled on the ground, and then springing up, went careening off through some bushes. He experienced a thrill of amazement when he came within view of a battery in action. The men there seemed to be in conventional moods, altogether unaware of the impending annihilation. The battery was disputing with a distant antagonist, and the gunners were wrapped in the admiration of their shooting. They were continually bending and coaxing postures over the guns. They seemed to be patting them on the back and encouraging them with words. The guns, stolid and undaunted, spoke with dogged valor. The precise gunners were coolly enthusiastic. They lifted their eyes every chance to the smoke-wreathed hillock from whence the hostile battery addressed them. The youth pitied them as he ran. Methodical idiots! Machine-like fools! The refined joy of planting shells in the midst of the other's battery formation would appear a little thing when the infantry came swooping out of the woods. The face of a youthful rider, who was jerking his frantic horse with an abandon of temper he might display in a placid barnyard, was deeply impressed upon his mind. He knew that he looked upon a man who would presently be dead. Two, he felt a pity for the guns, standing, six good comrades, in a bold row. He saw a brigade going to the relief of its pestered fellows. He scrambled upon a wee hill and watched it sweeping finely, keeping formation in difficult places. The blue of the line was crusted with steel color, and the brilliant flags projected. Officers were shouting. The sight also filled him with wonder. The brigade was hurrying briskly to be gulped into the infernal mouths of the war god. What manner of men were they, anyhow? Ah, it was some wondrous breed! Or else they didn't comprehend, the fools. A furious order caused commotion in the artillery. An officer on a bounding horse made maniacal motions with his arms. The teams went swinging up from the rear. The guns were whirled about, and the battery scampered away. The cannon, with their noses poked slantingly at the ground, grunted and grumbled like stout men, brave but with objections to hurry. The youth went on, moderating his pace since he had left the place of noises. Later he came upon a general of division, seated upon a horse that pricked its ears in an interested way at the battle. There was a great gleaming of yellow and patent leather about the saddle and bridle. The quiet man astride looked mouse-colored upon such a splendid charger. A jingling staff was galloping hither and thither. Sometimes the general was surrounded by horsemen, and at other times he was quite alone. He looked to be much harassed. He had the appearance of a businessman whose market is swinging up and down. The youth went slinking around this spot. He went as near as he dared, trying to overhear words. Perhaps the general, unable to comprehend chaos, might call upon him for information. And he could tell him. He knew all concerning it. 
Of a surety, the force was in a fix, and any fool could see that if they did not retreat while they had an opportunity, why... He felt he would like to thrash the general, or at least approach and tell him in plain words exactly what he thought him to be. It was criminal to stay calmly in one spot and make no effort to stay destruction. He loitered in a fever of eagerness for the division commander to apply to him. As he warily moved about, he heard the general call out irritably, Tompkins, go over and see Taylor, and tell him not to be in such an all-fired hurry. Tell him to halt his brigade in the edge of the woods. Tell him to detach a regiment. Say, I think the center will break if we don't help it out some. Tell him to hurry up. A slim youth on a fine chestnut horse caught these swift words from the mouth of his superior. He made his horse bound into a gallop almost from a walk in his haste to go upon his mission. There was a cloud of dust. A moment later, the youth saw the general bounce excitedly in his saddle. Yes, by heavens, they have! The officer leaned forward. His face was aflame with excitement. Yes, by heavens, they've held him! They've held him! He began to blithely roar at his staff. We'll wallop him now! We'll wallop him now! We got him, sure! He turned suddenly upon an aide. Here, you, Johns! Quick, right after Tompkins. See Taylor. Tell him to go in, everlastingly, like blazes, anything. As another officer sped his horse after the first messenger, the general beamed upon the earth like a sun. In his eyes was a desire to chant a pan. He kept repeating, They've held him, by heavens! His excitement made his horse plunge, and he merrily kicked and swore at it. He held a little carnival of joy on horseback. End of chapter 6「Is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 7 The youth cringed as if discovered in a crime. By heavens, they had won after all. The imbecile line had remained and become victors. He could hear cheering. He lifted himself upon his toes and looked in the direction of the fight. A yellow fog lay wallowing on the treetops. From beneath it came the clatter of musketry. Hoarse cries told of an advance. He turned away amazed and angry. He felt that he had been wronged. He had fled, he told himself, because annihilation approached. He had done a good part in saving himself, who was a little piece of the army. He had considered the time, he said, to be one in which it was the duty of every little piece to rescue itself if possible. Later the officers could fit the little pieces together again and make a battle front. If none of the little pieces were wise enough to save themselves from the flurry of death at such a time, why, then, where would be the army? It was all plain that he had proceeded according to very correct and commendable rules. His actions had been sagacious things. They had been full of strategy. They were the work of a master's legs. Thoughts of his comrades came to him. The brittle blue line had withstood the blows and won. He grew bitter over it. It seemed that the blind ignorance and stupidity of those little pieces had betrayed him. He had been overturned and crushed by their lack of sense in holding the position, when intelligent deliberation would have convinced them that it was impossible. He, the enlightened man, who looks afar in the dark, had fled because of his superior perceptions and knowledge. He felt a great anger against his comrades. He knew it could be proved that they had been fools. He wondered what they would remark when later he appeared in camp. His mind heard howls of derision. Their density would not enable them to understand his sharper point of view. He began to pity himself acutely. He was ill-used. He was trodden beneath the feet of an iron injustice. He had proceeded with wisdom, and from the most righteous motives under heaven's blue, only to be frustrated by hateful circumstances. A dull, animal-like rebellion against his fellows, war in the abstract, and fate grew within him. He shambled along with bowed head, 
his brain in a tumult of agony and despair. When he looked loweringly up, quivering at each sound, his eyes had the expression of those of a criminal who thinks his guilt little and his punishment great, and knows that he can find no words. He went from the fields into a thick woods, as if resolved to bury himself. He wished to get out of hearing of the crackling shots which were to him like voices. The ground was cluttered with vines and bushes, and the trees grew close and spread out like bouquets. He was obliged to force his way with much noise. The creepers, catching against his legs, cried out harshly as their sprays were torn from the barks of trees. The swishing saplings tried to make known his presence to the world. He could not conciliate the forest. As he made his way, it was always calling out protestations. When he separated embraces of trees and vines, the disturbed foliages waved their arms and turned their face leaves toward him. He dreaded lest these noisy motions and cries should bring men to look at him, so he went far, seeking dark and intricate places. After a time the sound of musketry grew faint, and the cannon boomed in the distance. The sun, suddenly apparent, blazed among the trees. The insects were making rhythmical noises. They seemed to be grinding their teeth in unison. A woodpecker stuck his impudent head around the side of a tree. A bird flew on light-hearted wing. Off was the rumble of death. It seemed now that nature had no ears. This landscape gave him assurance. A fair field holding life. It was the religion of peace. It would die if its timid eyes were compelled to see blood. He conceived nature to be a woman with a deep aversion to tragedy. He threw a pine cone at a jovial squirrel, and he ran with chattering fear. High in a treetop he stopped, and, poking his head cautiously from behind a branch, looked down with an air of trepidation. The youth felt triumphant at this exhibition. There was the law, he said. Nature had given him a sign. The squirrel, immediately upon recognizing danger, had taken to his legs without ado. He did not stand stolidly bearing his furry belly to the missile, and die with an upward glance at the sympathetic heavens. On the contrary, he had fled as fast as his legs could carry him. And he was but an ordinary squirrel. Two, doubtless no philosopher of his race. The youth wended, feeling that nature was of his mind. She reinforced his argument with proofs that lived where the sun shone. Once he found himself almost into a swamp. He was obliged to walk upon bog tufts and watch his feet to keep from the oily mire. Pausing at one time to look about him, he saw, out of some black water, a small animal pounce in and emerge directly with a gleaming fish. The youth went again into the deep thickets. The brushed branches made a noise that drowned the sounds of cannon. He walked on, going from obscurity into promises of a greater obscurity. At length he reached a place where the high, arching bows made a chapel. He softly pushed the green doors aside and entered. Pine needles were a gentle brown carpet. There was a religious half-light. Near the threshold he stopped, horror-stricken at the sight of a thing. He was being looked at by a dead man, who was seated with his back against a column-like tree. The corpse was dressed in a uniform that had once been blue, but was now faded to a melancholy shade of green. The eyes, staring at the youth, had changed to the dull hue to be seen on the side of a dead fish. The mouth was open. Its red had changed to an appalling yellow. Over the gray skin of the face ran little ants. 
One was trundling some sort of bundle along the upper lip. The youth gave a shriek as he confronted the thing. He was for moments turned to stone before it. He remained staring into the liquid-looking eyes. The dead man and the living man exchanged a long look. Then the youth cautiously put one hand behind him and brought it against a tree. Leaning upon this, he retreated, step by step, with his face still toward the thing. He feared that if he turned his back, the body might spring up and stealthily pursue him. The branches pushing against him threatened to throw him over upon it. His unguided feet, too, caught aggravatingly in brambles, and with it all he received a subtle suggestion to touch the corpse. As he thought of his hand upon it, he shuddered profoundly. At last he burst the bonds which had fastened him to the spot and fled, unheeding the underbrush. He was pursued by the sight of black ants swarming greedily upon the gray face and venturing horribly near to the eyes. After a time he paused, and, breathless and panting, listened. He imagined some strange voice would come from the dead throat, and squawk after him in horrible menaces. The trees about the portal of the chapel moved soughingly in a soft wind. A sad silence was upon the little guarding edifice. End of chapter 7 Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane Chapter 8 The trees began softly to sing a hymn of twilight. The sun sank until slanted bronze rays struck the forest. There was a lull in the noises of insects, as if they had bowed their beaks and were making a devotional pause. There was silence, save for the chanted chorus of the trees. Then, upon this stillness, there suddenly broke a tremendous clangor of sounds. A crimson roar came from the distance. The youth stopped. He was transfixed by this terrific medley of all noises. It was as if worlds were being rended. There was the ripping sound of musketry and the breaking crash of the artillery. His mind flew in all directions. He conceived the two armies to be at each other panther fashion. He listened for a time, then he began to run in the direction of the battle. He saw that it was an ironical thing for him to be running thus toward that which he had been at such pains to avoid. But he said in substance to himself, that if the earth and the moon were about to clash, many persons would doubtless plan to get upon the roofs to witness the collision. As he ran, he became aware that the forest had stopped its music, as if at last becoming capable of hearing the foreign sounds. The trees hushed and stood motionless. Everything seemed to be listening to the crackle and clatter and earth-shaking thunder. The chorus peaked over the still earth. It suddenly occurred to the youth that the fight in which he had been was, after all, but perfunctory popping. In the hearing of this present din, he was doubtful if he had seen real battle scenes. This uproar explained a celestial battle. It was tumbling hordes, a struggle in the air. Reflecting, he saw a sort of humor in the point of view of himself and his fellows during the late encounter. They had taken themselves and the enemy very seriously, and had imagined that they were deciding the war. Individuals must have supposed that they were cutting the letters of their names deep into everlasting tablets of brass, 
or enshrining their reputations for ever in the hearts of their countrymen, while, as to fact, the affair would appear in printed reports under a meek and immaterial title. But he saw that it was good, else, he said, in battle every one would surely run, save forlorn hopes and their ilk. He went rapidly on. He wished to come to the edge of the forest that he might peer out. As he hastened, there passed through his mind pictures of stupendous conflicts. His accumulated thought upon such subjects was used to form scenes. The noise was as the voice of an eloquent being, describing. Sometimes the brambles formed chains and tried to hold him back. Trees, confronting him, stretched out their arms and forbade him to pass. After its previous hostility, this new resistance of the forest filled him with a fine bitterness. It seemed that nature could not be quite ready to kill him. But he obstinately took roundabout ways, and presently he was where he could see long gray walls of vapor, where lay battle lines. The voices of cannon shook him. The musketry sounded in long, irregular surges that played havoc with his ears. He stood regardant for a moment. His eyes had an awestruck expression. He gawked in the direction of the fight. Presently he proceeded again on his forward way. The battle was like the grinding of an immense and terrible machine to him. Its complexities and powers, its grim processes, fascinated him. He must go close and see it produce corpses. He came to a fence and clambered over it. On the far side, the ground was littered with clothes and guns. A newspaper, folded up, lay in the dirt. A dead soldier was stretched with his face hidden in his arm. Farther off there was a group of four or five corpses keeping mournful company. A hot sun had blazed upon this spot. In this place the youth felt that he was an invader. This forgotten part of the battleground was owned by the dead men, and he hurried in the vague apprehension that one of the swollen forms would rise and tell him to be gone. He came finally to a road from which he could see in the distance dark and agitated bodies of troops, smoke fringed. In the lane was a blood-stained crowd streaming to the rear. The wounded men were cursing, groaning, and wailing. In the air, always, was a mighty swell of sound that it seemed could sway the earth. With the courageous words of the artillery and the spiteful sentences of the musketry mingled red cheers. And from this region of noises came the steady current of the maimed. One of the wounded men had a shoe full of blood. He hopped like a schoolboy in a game. He was laughing hysterically. One was swearing that he had been shot in the arm through the commanding general's mismanagement of the army. One was marching with an air imitative of some sublime drum major. Upon his features was an unholy mixture of merriment and agony. As he marched, he sang a bit of doggerel in a high and quavering voice. Sing a song of victory, a pocket full of bullets, five and twenty dead men baked in a pie. Parts of the procession limped and staggered to this tune. Another had the gray seal of death already upon his face. His lips were curled in hard lines and his teeth were clenched. His hands were bloody from where he had pressed them upon his wound. He seemed to be awaiting the moment when he should pitch headlong. He stalked like the specter of a soldier, his eyes burning with the power of a steer into the unknown. There were some who proceeded sullenly, full of anger at their wounds, and ready to turn upon anything as an obscure cause. An officer was carried along by two privates. He was peevish. 
Don't joggle so, Johnson, you fool, he cried. Think my leg is made of iron? If you can't carry me decent, put me down and let someone else do it. He bellowed at the tottering crowd who blocked the quick march of his bearers. Say, make way there, can't ye? Make way, Dickens take it all! They sulkily parted and went to the roadsides. As he was carried past, they made pert remarks to him. When he raged in reply and threatened them, they told him to be damned. The shoulder of one of the tramping bearers knocked heavily against the spectral soldier who was staring into the unknown. The youth joined this crowd and marched along with it. The torn bodies expressed the awful machinery in which the men had been entangled. Orderlies and couriers occasionally broke through the throng in the roadway, scattering wounded men right and left, galloping on, followed by howls. The melancholy march was continually disturbed by the messengers, and sometimes by bustling batteries that came swinging and thumping down upon them the officers shouting orders to clear the way. There was a tattered man, fouled with dust, blood and powder stained from hair to shoes, who trudged quietly at the youth's side. He was listening with eagerness and much humility to the lurid descriptions of a bearded sergeant. His lean features wore an expression of awe and admiration. He was like a listener in a country store, to wondrous tales told among the sugar-barrels. He eyed the story-teller with unspeakable wonder. His mouth was a gape in yokel fashion. The sergeant, taking note of this, gave pause to his elaborate history, while he administered a sardonic comment. "'Be careful, honey. You'll be a kitchen flies,' he said. The tattered man shrank back, abashed. After a time he began to sidle near to the youth, and in a diffident way tried to make him a friend. His voice was gentle as a girl's voice, and his eyes were pleading. The youth saw with surprise that the soldier had two wounds, one in the head, bound with a blood-soaked rag, and the other in the arm, making that member dangle like a broken bough. After they had walked together for some time, the tattered man mustered sufficient courage to speak. "'Was pretty good fat, wasn't it?' he timidly said. The youth, deep in thought, glanced up at the bloody and grim figure with its lamb-like eyes. "'What? Was pretty good fat, wasn't it?' "'Yes,' said the youth shortly. He quickened his pace. But the other hobbled industriously after him. There was an air of apology in his manner, but he evidently thought that he needed only to talk for a time, and the youth would perceive that he was a good fellow. "'Was pretty good fat, wasn't it?' he began in a small voice. And then he achieved the fortitude to continue. "'Dern me if I ever see fellers fight so.' "'Laws, how they did fight! I knowed the boys would like it when they once got square at it. The boys ain't had no fair chance up to now, but this time they showed what they was. I knowed it'd turn out this way. Ye yeah, can't lick them boys. No, sir. They're fighters, they be. He breathed a deep breath of humble admiration. He had looked at the youth for encouragement several times. He received none, but gradually he seemed to get absorbed in his subject. I was talking cross pickets with the boy from Georgie once, then that boy, he says, Your fellers will all run like hell when they once hear a gun, he says. Maybe they will, I says, but I don't believe none of it, I says. And but Jiminy, I says back to him, Maybe your fellers will all run like hell when they once hear a gun, I says. He laughed. Well, they didn't run today, did they, hey? No, sir. They fit and fit and fit. His homely face was suffused with a light of love for the army, which was to him all things beautiful and powerful. After a time he turned to the youth. "'Where are you hit, old boy?' he asked in a brotherly tone. The youth felt instant panic at this question, although at first its full import was not borne in upon him. "'What?' he asked. "'Where are you hit?' repeated the tattered man. "'Why,' began the youth, I, I, that is why I, 
he turned away suddenly and slid through the crowd. His brow was heavily flushed, and his fingers were picking nervously at one of his buttons. He bent his head and fastened his eyes studiously upon the button, as if it were a little problem. The tattered man looked after him in astonishment. End of chapter 8 Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at nicoledoolin.com This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Thomas, Atlanta, Georgia. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 9 The youth fell back in the procession until the tattered soldier was not in sight. Then he started to walk on with the others. But he was amid wounds. The mob of men was bleeding. Because of the tattered soldier's question, he now felt that his shame could be viewed. He was continually casting sidelong glances to see if the men were contemplating the letters of guilt he felt burned into his brow. At times he regarded the wounded soldiers in an envious way. He conceived persons with torn bodies to be peculiarly happy. He wished that he, too, had a wound, a red badge of courage. A spectral soldier was at his side like a stalking reproach. The man's eyes were still fixed in a stare into the unknown. His gray, appalling face had attracted attention in the crowd, and men, slowing to his dreary pace, were walking with him. They were discussing his plight, questioning him and giving him advice. In a dogged way he repelled them, signing to them to go on and leave him alone. The shadows of his face were deepening, and his tight lips seemed holding in check the moan of great despair. There could be seen a certain stiffness in the movements of his body, as if he were taking infinite care not to arouse the passion of his wounds. As he went on, he seemed always looking for a place, like one who goes to choose a grave. Something in the gesture of the man, as he waved the bloody and pitying soldiers away, made the youth start as if bitten. He yelled in horror. Tottering forward, he laid a quivering hand upon the man's arm. As the latter slowly turned his wax-like features toward him, the youth screamed, "'God! Jim Conklin!' The tall soldier made a little commonplace smile. "'Hello, Henry,' he said. The youth swayed on his legs and glared strangely. He stuttered and stammered, "'Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim!' The tall soldier held out his gory hand. There was a curious red and black combination of new blood and old blood upon it. "'Where you been, Henry?' he asked. He continued in a monotonous voice. "'I thought maybe you got keeled over. There's been thunder to pay today. I was worrying about it a good deal.' The youth still lamented. "'Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim!' "'You know,' said the tall soldier, "'I was out there.' He made a careful gesture. "'And, Lord, what a circus! And, but Jiminy, I got shot! I got shot!' Yes, but Jiminy, I got shot. He reiterated this fact in a bewildered way, as if he did not know how it came about. The youth put forth anxious arms to assist him, but the tall soldier went firmly, as if propelled. Since the youth's arrival as a guardian for his friend, the other wounded men had ceased to display much interest. They occupied themselves again in dragging their own tragedies toward the rear. Suddenly, as the two friends marched on, the tall soldier seemed to be overcome by a tremor. His face turned to a semblance of gray paste. He clutched the youth's arm and looked all about him, as if dreading to be overheard. Then he began to speak, in a shaking whisper. "'I tell you what I'm afraid of, Henry. I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid I'll fall down. And then, you know—' 
them damned artillery wagons. They like as not a run over me. That's what I'm afraid of. The youth cried out to him hysterically, I'll take care of you, Jim. I'll take care of you. I swear to God I will. Sure, will you, Henry? The tall soldier beseeched. Yes, yes, I tell you, I'll take care of you, Jim, protested the youth. He could not speak accurately because of the gulpings in his throat. But the tall soldier continued to beg in a lowly way. He now hung babe-like to the youth's arm. His eyes rolled in the wildness of his terror. "'I was always a good friend to you, wasn't I, Henry? I've always been a pretty good feller, ain't I? And it ain't much to ask, is it? Just to pull me along out of the road? I'd do it for you, wouldn't I, Henry?' He paused in piteous anxiety to wait his friend's reply. The youth had reached an anguish where the sobs scorched him. He strove to express his loyalty, but he could only make fantastic gestures. However, the tall soldier seemed suddenly to forget all those fears. He became again the grim, stalking specter of a soldier. He went stonily forward. The youth wished his friend to lean upon him, but the other always shook his head and strangely protested, No, no, no. Leave me be. Leave me be. His look was fixed again upon the unknown. He moved with mysterious purpose, and all of the youth's offers he brushed aside. No, no. Leave me be. Leave me be. The youth had to follow. Presently the latter heard a voice talking softly near his shoulder. Turning, he saw that it belonged to the tattered soldier. "'You'd better take him out of the road, partner. There's a battery coming hellity whoop down the road, and he'll get runned over. He's a goner anyhow in about five minutes. You can see that. You'd better take him out of the road. Where the blazes does he get his strength from?' "'Lord knows,' cried the youth. He was shaking his hands helplessly. He ran forward presently and grasped the tall soldier by the arm. "'Jim, Jim,' he coaxed, "'come with me.' The tall soldier weakly tried to wrench himself free. "'Huh,' he said vacantly. He stared at the youth for a moment. At last he spoke as if dimly comprehending. "'Oh, into the fields? Oh!' He started blindly through the grass. The youth turned once to look at the lashing riders and jouncing guns of the battery. He was startled from this view by a shrill outcry from the tattered man. "'God, he's running!' Turning his head swiftly, the youth saw his friend running in a staggering and stumbling way toward a little clump of bushes. His heart seemed to wrench itself almost free from his body at this sight. He made a noise of pain. He and the tattered man began a pursuit. There was a singular race. When he overtook the tall soldier, he began to plead with all the words he could find. "'Jim, Jim, what are you doing? What makes you do this way? You'll hurt yourself.' The same purpose was in the tall soldier's face. He protested in a dulled way, keeping his eyes fastened on the mystic place of his intentions. "'No, no, don't touch me. Leave me be. Leave me be.' The youth, aghast and filled with wonder at the tall soldier, began quaveringly to question him. "'Where you going, Jim? What you thinking about? Where you going? Tell me, won't you, Jim?' The tall soldier faced about as upon relentless pursuers. In his eyes there was a great appeal. "'Leave me be, can't you? Leave me be for a minute.' The youth recoiled. "'Why, Jim,' he said in a dazed way, "'what's the matter with you?' The tall soldier turned and, lurching dangerously, went on. The youth and the tattered soldier followed, sneaking as if whipped, feeling unable to face the stricken man if he should again confront them. They began to have thoughts of a solemn ceremony. There was something right-like in these movements of the doomed soldier." and there was a resemblance in him to a devotee of a mad religion, blood-sucking, muscle-wrenching, bone-crushing. They were awed and afraid. They hung back, lest he have at command a dreadful weapon. At last they saw him stop and stand motionless. 
Hastening up, they perceived that his face wore an expression telling he had at last found the place for which he had struggled. His spare figure was erect. His bloody hands were quietly at his side. He was waiting with patience for something that he had come to meet. He was at the rendezvous. They paused and stood, expectant. There was a silence. Finally the chest of the doomed soldier began to heave with a strained motion. It increased in violence until it was as if an animal was within and was kicking and tumbling furiously to be free. This spectacle of gradual strangulation made the youth writhe, and once, as his friend rolled his eyes, he saw something in them that made him sink, wailing to the ground. He raised his voice in a last supreme call, "'Jim! Jim! Jim!' The tall soldier opened his lips and spoke. He made a gesture. "'Leave me be. Don't touch me. Leave me be.' There was another silence while he waited. Suddenly his form stiffened and straightened, then it was shaken by a prolonged ague. He stared into space. To the two watchers there was a curious and profound dignity in the firm lines of his awful face. He was invaded by a creeping strangeness that slowly enveloped him. For a moment the tremor of his legs caused him to dance a sort of hideous hornpipe. His arms beat wildly about his head in expression of imp-like enthusiasm. His tall figure stretched itself to its full height. There was a slight rending sound. Then it began to swing forward, slow and straight, in the manner of a falling tree. A swift, muscular contortion made the left shoulder strike the ground first. The body seemed to bounce a little way from the earth. God, said the tattered soldier. The youth had watched, spellbound, this ceremony at the place of meeting. His face had been twisted into an expression of every agony he had imagined for his friend. He now sprang to his feet and, going closer, gazed upon the paste-like face. The mouth was open, and the teeth showed in a laugh. As the flap of the blue jacket fell away from the body, he could see that the side looked as if it had been chewed by wolves. The youth turned with sudden livid rage toward the battlefield. He shook his fist. He seemed about to deliver a philippic. Hell! The red sun was pasted in the sky like a wafer. End of chapter 9 this recording is in the public domain. This recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Morris Noer. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 10. The tattered man stood musing. "'Well, he was a regular Jim Dandy for nerve, will not he?' said he, finally, in a little awestruck voice. "'A regular Jim Dandy!' He thoughtfully poked one of the docile hands with his foot. "'I wonder where he got his strength from. i never seen a man do like that before. It was a funny thing. Well, he was a regular Jim Dandy.' The youth desired to screech out his grief. He was stabbed, but his tongue lay dead in the tomb of his mouth. He threw himself again upon the ground and began to brood. The tattered man stood musing. "'Look a here, partner,' he said, after a time. He regarded the corpse as he spoke. "'He's up and gone, ain't he? And we might as well begin to look out for old number one. This here thing is all over. He's up and gone, ain't he? And he's all right here.' Nobody won't bother him, and I must say I ain't enjoying any great health myself these days. The youth, awakened by the tattered soldier's tone, looked quickly up. He saw that he was swinging uncertainly on his legs, and that his face had turned to a shade of blue. Good Lord, he cried, you ain't going to—not you, too. 
The tattered man waved his hand. Nary die, he said. All I want is some pea soup and a good bed. Some pea soup, he repeated dreamfully. The youth arose from the ground. I wonder where he came from. I left him over there, he pointed, and now I find him here. And he was coming from over there, too. He indicated a new direction. They both turned toward the body, as if to ask of it a question. Well, at length spoke the tattered man, there ain't no use in our staying here and trying to ask him anything. The youth nodded an assent wearily. They both turned to gaze for a moment at the corpse. The youth murmured something. Well, he was a Jim Dandy, wasn't he? said the tattered man, as if in response. They turned their backs upon it and started away. For a time they stole softly, treading with their toes. It remained laughing there in the grass. I'm commencing to feel pretty bad, said the tattered man, suddenly breaking one of his little silences. I'm commencing to feel pretty damn bad. The youth groaned. Oh, Lord. He wondered if he was to be the tortured witness of another grim encounter. But his companion waved his hand reassuringly. Oh, I'm not going to die yet. They're too much dependent on me for me to die yet. No, sir, nary die. I can't. You ought to see the swad of children I've got, and all like that. The youth, glancing at his companion, could see by the shadow of a smile that he was making some kind of fun. As they plodded on, the tattered soldier continued to talk. Besides, if I died, I wouldn't die the way that feller did. That was the funniest thing. I'd just flop down, I would. I'd never seen a feller die the way that feller did. You know Tom Jameson? He lives next door to me, up home. He's a nice feller, he is, and we was always good friends. Smart, too. Smart as a steel trap. Well, when we was a-fightin' this afternoon, all of a sudden he begin to rip up and cuss and beller at me. You're shot, you blamed infernal. He swear horrible, he says to me. I put up my hand to my head, and where I looked at him, my fingers, I seen sure enough I was shot. I give a holler and begin to run, but before I could get away, another one hit me in the arm and whirled me clean around. I got scared when they was all a-shootin' behind me, and I run to beat all, but I caught it pretty bad. I have an idea I've been a-fightin' yet, if it weren't for Tom Jameson. Then he made a calm announcement. There's two of them, little ones, but they're beginning to have fun with me now. I don't believe I can walk much further. They went slowly on in silence. You look pretty peaked yourself, said the tattered man at last. I bet you've got a worser one than you think. You'd better take care of your hurt. It won't do to let such things go. It might be inside mostly, and them's plays thunder. Where is it located? But he continued his harangue without waiting for a reply. I see a filler get hit plumb in the head when my regiment was a standin' at ease once. And everybody yelled to him, Hurt, John? Are you hurt much? No, says he. He looked kind of surprised, and he went on telling him how he felt. He said he didn't feel nothing. But, by dad, the first thing that feller knowed, he was dead. Yes, he was dead, stone dead. So, you want to watch out. You might have some queer kind of hurt yourself. You can't never tell. Where isn't you located? The youth had been wriggling since the introduction of this topic. He now gave a cry of exasperation and made a furious motion with his hand. Oh, don't bother me, he said. He was enraged against the tattered man and could have strangled him. His companion seemed ever to play intolerable parts. They were ever upraising the ghost of shame on the stick of their curiosity. He turned toward the tattered man as one at bay. Now. Don't bother me, he repeated with a desperate menace. Well, Lord knows I don't want to bother anybody, said the other. There was a little accent of despair in his voice as he replied, Lord knows I've got enough of my own to tend to. The youth, who had been holding a bitter debate with himself, 
and casting glances of hatred and contempt at the tattered man, here spoke in a hard voice. Goodbye, he said. The tattered man looked at him in gaping amazement. Why, why, partner, where are you going? he asked unsteadily. The youth looked at him, could see that he too, like that other one, was beginning to act dumb and animal-like. His thoughts seemed to be floundering about in his head. Now, now, look a here, you Tom Jameson. Now, I won't have this. This here won't do. Where, where are you going? The tattered man looked at him in gaping amazement. Why, why, partner, where are you going? He asked unsteadily. The youth, looking at him, could see that he, too, like that other one, was beginning to act dumb and animal-like. His thoughts seemed to be floundering about in his head. Now, now, look uh, here, you Tom Jameson. Now, I won't have this. This here won't do. Where, where are you going? The youth pointed vaguely. Over there, he replied. Well, now look uh, here now, said the tattered man, rambling on in idiot fashion. His head was hanging forward, and his words were slurred. This thing won't do now, Tom Jameson. It won't do. I know you, you pig-headed devil. You want to go tromping off with a bad hurt. It ain't right now, Tom Jameson. It ain't. You want to leave me take care of you, Tom Jameson. It ain't right. It ain't for you to go tromping off with a bad hurt. It ain't. Ain't. Ain't right. It ain't. In reply, the youth climbed a fence and started away. He could hear the tattered man bleeding plaintively. Once he faced about angrily. What? Look here, now, Tom Jameson, now, it ain't. The youth went on. Turning at a distance, he saw the tattered man wandering about helplessly in the field. He now thought that he wished he was dead. He believed he envied those men whose bodies lay strewn over the grass of the fields and on the fallen leaves of the forest. The simple questions of the tattered man had been knife thrust to him. They asserted a society that probes pitilessly at secrets until all is apparent. His late companion's chance persistency made him feel that he could not keep his crime concealed in his bosom. It was sure to be brought plain by one of those arrows which cloud the air and are constantly pricking, discovering, proclaiming those things which are willed to be forever hidden. He admitted that he could not defend himself against this agency. It was not within the power of vigilance. End of chapter 10